Have you ever wondered if you could find what you love doing and something that the world needs and that you can be rewarded for that? That's what we'll talk about today. If you can just keep putting one foot in front of the other, fantastical things can happen. Cheryl Crow. Today, we're going to talk about a Japanese concept. The information comes primarily from a book called How to Ikigai, Lessons for Finding Happiness and Living Your Life's Purpose by Tim Tamashiro. And I thought this was a really practical book about a concept that he knows very well in teaching it to other people. And it has some practical uses, some ways of looking at your life that I think makes things a lot clearer. This is a term that comes from Okinawa. He says that if you're trying to pronounce this word, the very first thing you have to do is smile because the sound is best pronounced when your face is in a smile position. He says that the Ikigai map has four simple directions to follow as a basic term. Do what you love. Do what you're good at. Do what the world needs. Then do what you can be rewarded for. A lot of us get a number of those things. Maybe you love singing, but you're not very good at it and the world will not reward you for it. Maybe you can get paid for being an amazing developer, and you're good at it, and you can be rewarded for it, but you don't love it. So you can see that if some of those things are true, you could have an unhappy life until you get all of those things to be true. He says the word is made up of two other words. One of them means worth. That's the guy part. And the other means life. So this is about life's worth. And that's where you're trying to find that combination of where something that you do in your life is worthwhile, not just to you, but to the world. He says that the key to all of this is understanding what gifts you have and how to put them into the proper use. He says it's also a part of having a balanced life that's both productive and enjoyable. Again, if you have one of those but not the other, you are out of balance and your life is probably not very happy. So it's not entirely about doing the things you want to do or doing the things that the world wants you to do. It's about doing both. He says that this whole process is about taking a path, not just from our friends and family, but of self-discovery and also a discovery of what's going on in the world. It forces you to pay attention to the things that are going around you. It has you looking for clues in your life, looking for clues in the world that are out there. And then when you understand the full picture, you will have the greatest knowledge, the greatest ability to fulfill your life's purpose. And he indicates that sometimes change isn't all that fun. But the fun part is when you bring it all together and your life is fulfilling and involved in the things that you love, it will be exciting. It'll be energizing and you will have true joy once the work is done. And he says that the first step is to choose change. And that means that you have to decide you will change, that you're not going to just stay stuck into the position you're in today. You will make a concerted effort at making this change. He mentioned some things that are some real barriers to our success in this process. And the first one is being afraid of failing or the results leave you failing. Maybe you lose money. Maybe you lose the job you have and you don't find another one you like. That holds us back. He also mentions that sometimes we're afraid of our success. What if we get everything that we want? And maybe it's not all that is cracked up to be. He says, too, sometimes we'll have a fear of what other people will think. What if we find that thing that we love doing? that we're good at doing, the world rewards us for doing it, and the world around us needs us to do it. But the people around us think it's strange, or they think it's funny, or they think this process is silly. They're afraid of being made fun of. And he reminds you that this is about having joy in your life. You will find the thing that you love doing, and it will bring you fulfillment. That's going to be the resolution to all of these fears. Nobody else has a say in what it is that brings you happiness. He also mentions that some people have a fear of discomfort, and it might bring you discomfort to look in these places, to find these things, to find the activity you're looking for. 
Of course, change is frequently uncomfortable, but that is not a reason not to do it. It will be a temporary discomfort and then followed with joy because we found the thing that we're really looking to find in our lives. But he says that if we just stay where we are, we don't look for the thing that we're really good at, thing we really love doing, and that the world will reward us for it and wants us to do it, we will live a life without intention, without learning, and it'll make us in the end suffer for that decision. So the first step is paying attention to the things that interest you. If something just comes into your life and suddenly you're very interested in it and you're very tuned into it, that's a good hint that this is something that you will really enjoy, something that you really will follow up learning more about. And he says, if you're going to do this and you promised yourself you're going to invest this type of energy in having this new life, this new way of looking at the world around you, he says you're going to learn a lot about yourself too. And it's going to be fun because you're really involving yourself in you being you. Some people, he admits, when they get started in this process, really don't understand where to go. They don't think that there are things they're particularly good at. They don't think that there are things that they're particularly like that the world would pay them to do or reward their effort. And so they get a little bit depressed at the beginning, but he assures them there is a path forward and that we all have Ikigai in us, just like everybody else does. And he thinks where people get tripped up is that this may not be something you get paid for. Rewarding comes in many different flavors. So if you have something that falls into this pattern, it may be something that you get rewarded just by doing it, or it may be something that you get rewarded in a different way. But just keep that in mind. He warns everyone to get away from the shoulds in life. I should do this. You should do that. Because in those cases, they're not helping us find this true purpose in our lives. It's really about that life's worth. And other people don't have a right to tell you what that is. This is something that you're going to find in your own self-discovery. He mentions that we are going to need grit and that we will have to stick to it in order to find this. But one day, we're going to realize what this thing is. He says another thing that you can try is to look at your dreams, look at different experiments in your life, try different things out. Maybe also look towards your childhood for hints at what you might really love. I think it's a good one because I think when we were kids, we were never burdened with the big overwhelming questions in our lives. And so those true loves that you have will come out better when you're a child sometimes because There's nothing filtering it out. Sometimes when we get to be adults, we filter it. Well, I love astronomy, but what am I going to do? Be an astronomer? No, I'm not going to be an astronomer. But is there something that's related to that hint as a child where it makes you dream of doing that? I used to love astronomy more than anything. And in college, I learned that there just weren't many jobs in astronomy. So I backed away from it and took something a little bit more practical. But now I think, is there a method of using astronomy or using the thing that you loved about it to produce that great thing? Is there a way to make this work? And he says, as we try different things, as we experiment in our lives, we'll get better and better at this. We will start to learn all the things that we're good at and we'll start finding the things that we really love doing. We'll see some trend lines in our lives that will help us start to narrow down what it is we're good at and we like doing. So he says when we do discover the thing that we're good at, the benefits become immediate because we suddenly start to realize the thing that we really love doing and the thing that we're really good at doing. And that right there is going to be enough to make our lives better. You will start to feel better about your life. You'll start to feel more satisfaction from your life and that will be an improvement. He then discusses something he calls the half ikigai and the full ikigai. The half is where you're really focused on what you love and what you're good at. And those two things are the starting point. The full ikigai be a little harder to achieve and might take more time. And then it is about finding what the world needs and how you can be rewarded for it. And some people just find it enough to do the first two things but going all the way will help you even more. 
He mentions a growth mindset, and that's by Carol Dweck. And what Carol Dweck talks about in her mindset book is that we all have to determine what our capacity for happiness is. She talks about a fixed mindset, and a fixed mindset is that we're not able to get the things we want. But a growth mindset, she says, is when we love a challenge. We love to figure things out, and we're hoping that we will learn from every new experience, every new experiment, and it will increase our capacity for happiness, our capacity for knowing ourselves better, and for doing so much more in our life. That's the growth mindset. She says when you get to that point, difficult things don't deter us anymore because we have learned how to analyze those things, how to overcome them, and to move beyond them. That's the growth mindset. And so the best way we can jump into this whole project is to do this part-time, he says. Obviously, you have a life. You have things that you have to do. You might have family. You might have friends and a job where you can't just jump into all of this right away. So you'll be able to do this on a part-time basis. Do this when you have time. Take that growth mindset and start learning more and more about you, what you love, and what you're good at. He even suggests that maybe you could split up your day into three and spend one-third of your day in your normal life, one-third of your day sleeping, and then one-third of your day pursuing your ikigai. He also mentions there's weekends too, where you have more time to do that as well. He thinks that you can discover some of these things by conducting interviews with people you know in your life who can help you out. That you start basically researching this like it's a scientific topic and trying to investigate what's inside your brain that can help you get to this first two items in Ikigai. He says you can go to a bookstore, do research, read books about things, and really investigate in depth the thing that you're good at and that you have an aptitude for. Now, of course, keep in mind that it may not be something that you're particularly good at right now, but maybe you have the skills or the surrounding gifts that will allow you to do that. For example, I've been out of astronomy for a long time, and so I'm not as up to date about all the different scientific theories, all the different things that are going on, like I was when I was in college. But I have the aptitude to learn those things because I learned them before. And so even if I'm behind, I still can use my research time to get caught up again in the most recent information. And he says when we experiment with tiny things, they're meant to really give us small bits of joy too. Again, if we're finding the thing we're good at and we love doing, when we get a chance to do them, even in a little tiny experiment, we will be happier about it and we will be better for it. And he says now that he found his own, His days are full of opportunities. He says that it allows him to send a light back into the world again, and he gets it back all over again. Because it really showed him his purpose, he wakes up every day with purpose, and he goes to bed with purpose because it's important. He says it's even possible that maybe to get your ikigai, you could get some counseling. You could do presentations to your family, your friends, people in your life so they can help you understand what it is that you have for your strength and to get some honest feedback about it. And if we feel like it takes too much time to really investigate the things that we're good at and the things that we love, he really wants us to ask ourselves, how much time should we spend in trying to find the thing that will bring us true happiness in our life and if we're really investing in it the way we should? He mentions doing gap years and gap years are about, in college, taking a year off before you find your first real job. But in this case, it means possibly taking a year off from doing what you're doing to try to find the thing that you're really meant to do, to find the thing that will bring you happiness before you jump into the next thing. Not all of us have that ability to do that kind of activity because of the money, the cost, but if you can do it, it can lead you down the right path to determining what it is that you're meant to do. He says that if we take a gap year, We'll get a chance to meet new people, be in new experiences, and be in new challenges. And just having that different outlook in your life can mean everything in finding that. I mentioned in the last podcast that I spent a summer overseas on an archaeological dig. And just being away from the people who were practically weighing me down helped me learn more about myself. 
helped me learn that the path I was taking wasn't doing so well. So I didn't really even take a gap year. I took a gap three months. But just being away from the things that were bringing me down helped immensely. And maybe you can't do that. Maybe you have to provide for people. But are there ways that you can take gaps so that you can get away a little bit and have some insight? Maybe you go camping for a weekend. I don't know if the author of this book would agree that's enough time, but do what you can in order to gain some perspective in your life. He suggests that if you do get a chance to take a gap year, that you spend the whole year being you, doing exactly what is you. And that should be exciting to us, as well as a little bit scary, to just spend a whole year in a brand new environment doing exactly what it is we were meant to do. He says that you'll get a lot of benefit from it. I think that this is an interesting idea. I don't know how realistic it is for most people. We're providing for ourselves, our families. We're on a pathway. Maybe we have a job where we have a pathway. And maybe that job is going to actually get us to that fulfilling life. But we won't know if we quit the job and just go have a gap year. But he is sold on the idea. I'm a little bit iffy on it because I think it's too hard to do. So I suggest small experiments small steps, in trying to find the thing that makes you the happiest. He says that even maybe in retirement is when you're going to get a chance to do it all. Do the full ikigai. Not just the first two things, but also the last two things. Because maybe you have all the time in the world, but not all the responsibilities in the world. Maybe you have the money and the resources to start living the life that you were meant to have. The problem he says with that is that you have to wait until you're retired. And that could be a really long time. And he suggests that maybe you would want to find these things out much earlier in your life. Or that maybe by the time you're retired, you might have some health problems and you won't be able to do the things that are truly fulfilling to you. I'll leave it up to you to decide that if you can go after those last two items, what the world needs you to do and what the world will reward you for doing, can you take a gap year? Or can you just take some small times, a weekend retreat, maybe some evenings to get away and start investigating how you can do those last two items? Maybe you wait till you're retired and that might be the best way too. But that's going to have to be a very personal decision where the author of this book, where I can't really tell you what that is. He suggests that if you do decide that you want to take a year off, you have to start putting away money for it and you have to start putting a lot of money away from it. Then you'll have to decide what it is you're going to do. Are you going to travel? Are you just going to stay at home and do something different? But planning, savings is the key to doing this gap year. I find the whole thing scary, but maybe it'll be interesting to you. He also wants you to know that some days we'll be climbing mountains, seeing oceans, and other days we'll be watching television. But that's okay. It's going to be a mixed bag of all sorts of different experiences. Some of them amazing and some of them not so amazing. He says that the year, quote, is not a year of boundless energy. But he says if you do get a chance to work on this, you'll discover new passions in your life. You'll be able to increase the ones that you already have. You'll get a chance to actually do those things and spend a significant amount of time on it. And you will feel great about it because you will have a new sense of energy, a new sense of purpose, and you will get to have your dreams. You'll get to do that fulfilling thing. You'll reconnect with yourself. The things that stress you out on a day-to-day basis will reduce because you are doing the thing that you love and the thing that you're good at and the thing that the world wants you to do. So your day-to-day stresses will go down. Again, I think it's a big ask to do a whole gap year. And I think it takes a person who's in a very special place in their life. I was just listening to a podcast of Jill on money and a woman on there was talking about how she saved a bunch of money and she wanted to get away from her job for a year and go live with her sister and help her sister with a brand new baby and then reevaluate her life so she could decide what it is she needs to go. Sounds a little bit like this, but the difference is, is that she had the money saved, she had the right opportunity, and she had the right timing to make this work in her life. I really doubt that a lot of people have that ability to do that right now. So he says that if you are looking for an Ikigai project, it can look a little bit like this, is that you set a goal of finding that half Ikigai 
in 30 days. That's his first suggestion. He says that you can start to do small experiments. You can have a side hustle. Maybe you can get a part-time job that does what it is you think will be the best thing for you. Maybe you'll find out it's not the right thing. Maybe you'll find out it's amazing. If you're able to start doing it in some capacity, in some small experiment in your life, that's when you know for sure. He says that you should do a lot of note-taking about your experiments, about the things that you're trying to do. Try to hone it a little bit better. Again, if I loved astronomy and that was a thing I just adored as a child, can I get a job as a part-time astronomer? Probably not. But are there things in my life I could do now and experiment with astronomy that would make me just as happy? So writing those things down and writing down the results will find a different way of expressing myself in this project. And then he said at the end of the 30 days, check in on yourself. See how you feel. Do you feel like it's going down the right path? Do you think you found the right thing? Or do you have to keep on looking and having more experiments and more investigation into you to find your half Ikigai? So hopefully this is a good step in helping you get some new clarity on a way from Japan to find the thing that you're meant to do in life, to find the thing that the world needs you to be good in in your life. And if you can find that, it should be wonderful. It should really bring you true fulfillment. Again, to me, it sounds a little bit optimistic about how quickly you can find this thing, but it doesn't happen at all until you start working on it. So the very first step is to actually do it, to actually try it and start that investigation so that you can get at least to the half Ikigai. And then once you find out what that is, keep going for the full Ikigai. I think for me in thinking about all of this is podcasting is really that half icky guy to me. I've never found anything that I have taken to so much that I spend so much of my time thinking about and thinking about other podcasts and other things I can do with podcasting. So maybe I found my thing. And when reading this book, that's the word that kept coming back to me. Podcasting. I like astronomy. I liked it as a kid. Can I have a podcast about astronomy? and bring those two things together, that's worth thinking about. And now for our fun entertainment quote of the week, it comes from Mad Men. Although, sometimes when people get what they want, they realize how limited their goals were. That's right. You don't want to have limited goals. You want to find the right goals. And that could be done through Ikigai. Can you find your half Ikigai or your full Ikigai in order to not limit your goals? All right, everyone, thanks so much for listening. I hope you have a great, fulfilling week. If you have anything that you want to tell me or share with me what your half guy is, you can email me at jill at smallstepspod.com. 